to my channel. Last spring, I filmed a video about how I set up Google Forms for my students in the hopes that it would help teachers that were just starting to use Google Forms, as I was someone that was starting to use them regularly for instruction. But since then, I've learned some different tips and tricks, so I wanted to share those. And additionally, I wanted to share about my process for setting up Google Forms that I purchased from Teachers Pay Teachers. So for this example, this is actually a Google Form that will be available in my store soon. So I'll have that linked when it is ready. And this is just like a little sample of finding sides using trigonometry. And typically when I download Google Forms from Teachers Pay Teachers from any seller, they pretty much look like this. So the first thing that I do is go to settings and I turn on collect email addresses and then I turn on restrict to users. And here instead it would say in my school district and it's trusted organizations. This one right here says busy Miss BB because this is in my business Google Drive. So you can turn on the response receipts, which I do for tests. I turn it on to always and that way students are getting emails of what they did just in case something happens because there have been instances where students that I trust have said I completed that, but when I go through the submissions, they're not listed there. So it could be a technology glitch, it could be something that they did by accident, but usually for the activities that we do, like the practice, I don't do that. And a lot of times this is already clicked when I purchase a form from Teachers Pay Teachers and I turn that off. I let my students redo their Google Forms as many times as they want. The only time that I use the limit to one response is when my students are taking a test. I only let them turn in a test once. So I leave these two blank. I don't bother with those. And then in presentation, usually this is unclicked. So I turn this on. These might be clicked, so I usually turn those off. And then in the confirmation message, I usually type out, great job if you earned less than, and whatever full credit is, in this case, I only put five in there, so it'd be five out of five. And then I say, you can resubmit or redo for a higher grade. And then I've started recently adding in a second line that says, if you earned less than, and in this case, it'd be four out of five, redo for a passing grade. So I'll go through and figure out what the passing grade would be, like what's the minimum that students could get, and I put it right in here. So that way when they finish their Google form, they are seeing this message, and when they get the score, they know right away whether or not they passed and they're good or whether or not they failed and need to redo it. So here's what students see when they submit a response. This is what that confirmation message looks like. So they can see right here and then it, they can go to view score and they can get their score here. Then the next tab that I go to is quizzes. It's already turned on to a quiz when I purchase from Teachers Pay Teachers and sometimes this one's clicked. It depends on the seller. So mine are always um, immediately after the submission unless it was a test. If it's a test, I turn it on to later and I manually review all of the submissions. And then down here where it says respondent can see, I leave missed corrections. I turn off correct answers. If they have the correct answers and then they're allowed to redo it, they're gonna go back and put in the correct answers without doing any of the work to fix it. And then I leave the point values on. So once I've gone through all of that, I will click save. And so that changes this right here to say this form is automatically collecting email address and this would say for my school's users. So then I'll take these top three things and delete them. So the first name I don't need and the last name I don't need because it's automatically collected by their email address and that's how my school set up. So if your school set up similarly and you're comfortable or used to seeing your students' names and their email addresses, you don't need those sections. And then class period, I take out. That's something that I only put in to my Google Forms when I sell them on Teachers Pay Teachers, just as a way to help teachers organize what they're doing. What I choose to do with my Google Forms for my students is not worry about the class period because for each course I have at most two sections. And so I know students by name and I immediately know which class period they're in. So I don't really need Google Forms to sort that out for me. So now if I go to the responses tab and it shows me some of these different things and what I always look for is right here, the frequently missed questions. And that tells me which questions I should go over with my students. 
this is what it looks like when it's just their email. So you get their email, their score, and then when that score was released. There's only one response here because I did the other responses before having the email collection turned on. But this is what bothers me right here where it shows me the questions that students had wrong. I don't know which ones they are. Like if I wanted to scroll through the form and see them, I can't do that. I have to click on each one and then it only brings me to what the responses look like here. And I don't know which question it was that they had trouble on. So what I do is in the questions, I always add in a number. So I'll go through and number all of these. And so now when I look at the frequently missed questions, I know exactly which ones are coming up as being frequently missed. And it's also just good practice. Like we know that as teachers, it's a lot easier for me if I have a student say, hey, I'm struggling on number two. So we should definitely be numbering these things anyway. Okay, and so my favorite new trick is if I click on the question and I click on these three dots here, I can turn on response validation. And this gives you so many different options and there's all kinds of things you could do if you teach different subjects. But in math, what I've been doing is I've been making sure it's on number and then I set it to is number. And then for my custom error text, I put in enter as a number only. And that's because I would have students submit their form and get the entire thing wrong because what they were typing in for their answer was X equals 4.2. And just trying to accommodate that in the form is such a pain because you have to do X equals 4.2, no spaces, X equals 4.2 with spaces, capital X equals 4.2. And it got to be too much. So now I just have it set that it won't accept their responses unless it's a number. The only time that you do not want to use this, however, is if you want students to enter their answer as a fraction. When they put that slash in there for the division bar, it gives them an error because that comes up set Google Forms, that's not a number. And so that doesn't work. So don't do this if it's for fractions. You can always communicate to them in the directions what to do, which is what I did for the longest time. And this is like one extra step, but it's a lot easier. So when I'm making my own Google Forms from scratch, I'll have the first question completely formatted how I want it. I make sure that in the answer key, I have it set to being worth one point, marking all the answers cor incorrect. And then I hit this right here to duplicate so that I will just go in and I would just change the picture or change the text if I needed to. But it's already set with that response validation. I don't have to do that every single time. And then I would just go in and change that answer there. So I hope that all made sense. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'd be so happy to help you with this. I really enjoy using Google Forms. I know that some teachers might be getting bored with them at this point in distance teaching, and it's understandable, but doing something consistent makes a lot of things a lot easier, especially communicating with your students what to do. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.